Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Hour of the Time with Doyle Shamley here in Eager, Arizona, and our special guest. And the day is being is the first of August, two thousand and five, Monday, and we want to welcome you to another exciting broadcast here. Now, if you'd like to contact the Hour of the Time, you may do so by writing Hour of the Time, P.O. Box nine four zero, Eager, spelled E A G A R, Arizona eight five nine two five. Again, that's Hour of the Time, P.O. Box 940, Eager, Arizona, 85925. If you'd like to visit our website, it's hourofthetime.com. That's hourofthetime.com. There you'll find a wonderful, huge array of research materials, news links, data, current projects, and special projects. That's hourofthetime.com. Now, if you'd like to email me directly, it's hourofthetime at hotmail. Dot com. That's hour of the time at hotmail.com. And the studio number is 928 333 2942. That's 928 333 2942. Now, today we've got uh, part 13 of our ongoing series here on ecumenicals, New Age religious movements, dispensationalism, uh, their ties to the esoteric and mystery schools. And we're going to go into a new subsection today of this long-going series, and it will culminate with the aggregate of some of Bill's advanced work that he did, a lot from this exact same researcher, and aid to the hour of the time here, our special guest Rob with us here, and not Rob from Canada, so don't get him confused and email the wrong guy. We're going to culminate this into what Bill and I was working on before he was murdered, and that is Mystery Babylon 2. It's going to have a good cross-section of research in different areas. Now, you need to understand this research, ladies and gentlemen, and pay attention. Write down all the references and names and dates and books that we're giving you because without that understanding, you won't understand the threat as it comes. Now, there is a definite, planned, intentional move to subvert fundamental Christianity around the world to aid in uniting the churches under a world church guise to help with the establishment of a socialist world dictatorship or a new world order, ladies and gentlemen. Plain and simple, in writing, no arguments. That is the goal of the world socialist. And you will be a slave. The only way to fight it is to understand their tactics and techniques, see through them, and fight back with understanding. Now, the Hour of the Time is listener-supported, and we need that support, ladies and gentlemen. Either donations directly to the P.O. Box or via the website if you'd like to use PayPal. Or, better yet, donate for research materials. We have thousands of audio broadcasts and special series is coming, covering the whole gamut of subjects. To expand your research and share these with your family, please. Also, publications and video presentations. So there's a lot there. If you want a hard copy of the catalog sent first class mail, just simply write the P.O. box and give us a donation for the replication cost and shipping cost. Uh, you can also go to the website, hourofthetime.com, and see the entire catalog right there. That's under the hot shop, hot for hour of the time, H-O-T-T. -T. Right there, the main link on the front page of our site. Now we're going to go to a quick musical break. And then we will bring Rob on here to continue this special series. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to announce a couple other features 
and special things just for the Hour of the Time listening audience that some of our researchers have made available to us. gentlemen again you're listening to the hour of the time here the first of august monday 2005 with part 13 of our special series on the ecumenicals dispensationalism new age religious movements their ties with the esoteric and the mystery schools and their ultimate typical socialist tactic goal to subvert fundamentalist christianity to easier make easier the unification of churches under a one world church umbrella to help propagate a one world socialist dictatorship government now our special guest today rob and it's not rob co-host and webmaster so don't email the wrong person has extended an opportunity to the listening audience that's unique to us he is uh, willing to partake in one to one-on-one email uh, research and sharing with you and the listening audience uh, that's a special opportunity. Instead of asking me something, I'm going to forward it to him. Just go directly to him. Don't abuse it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's a rare opportunity. We don't need to blow it. And his email address is rltwoco at aol.com. That's rltwoco at aol.com. Now we're going to bring him online here. And today, our, we're going to get into a subpart, kind of like the Four Horsemen Explained. We're going to be covering more specifically 
today and then tomorrow, etc. Dominion theology, the latter rain movement, uh, manifest sons of God, and uh, some various other areas. And I'll let Rob go into that. Hey, Rob, how you doing today? Good, Doyle. All right, All set. Hey, <laughs> cool. Hey, Rob, uh, what do you got for us today? Well, today we're going to start in a little series on Dominion theology and uh, a lot of the sub movements connected to it, like the Latter Rain movement, Manifest Sons of God, the idea of the shepherding discipleship movement, uh, the idea that the fivefold uh, gifts have been restored, like the apostles, everyone's an apostle and a prophet now. And, uh, you know, just all these different movements connect to Reconstructionism, which is really, again, Dominion Theology. But today we're just really going to be focusing mostly on Dominion Theology. If we have time, we'll get into the Latter Rain Movement. But briefly, what we could do, just do a quick review of what Charismatics and what these people, uh, Word of Faith Movement, is really connected, Word of Faith Movement and Dominion Theology, what they really believe in. And we've been talking about this before. And some of the ideas are, again, that men are gods, men may become gods, and may, men may become like God. Again, the idea of, we talked about this before, about pantheism and penentheism. Uh, again, the idea they teach that the law, faith is a law or force that may be activated by anyone, whether they are a disciple of Jesus Christ or not. Again, we talked about that in the Word of Faith movement, that faith is a law or force. And they, they again they believe the idea of the, the ability to perform miracles, signs, and wonders is latent within everyone. We just all all we have to do is learn how to activate the spiritual laws upon which faith is based. Uh, this is again the apostles and prophets believe this, and this is again in the Word of Faith movement. Again, the, the, the main theology of these people again the same as the Word of Faith movement believe that God is bound by these spiritual laws and must. He must respond to anyone, even his enemies, if they exercise knowledge of them. Uh, they believe that Jesus is our elder brother who mastered the spiritual laws of nature, and he is our example to do the same, that we should do the same. Uh, the man, like the manifest sons of God and the, these people, they believe in men may attain immortality by becoming perfected spiritually. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's the idea of little gods, and in, in the you know during World after World War II, they had to manifest some of the manifest sons of God movement. People like Paul Kane came out of this. Uh, we talked about Paul Kane yesterday, uh, uh, a couple of shows ago actually. Yeah, <laughs> and, we can. Uh, um, the Four Horsemen. We talked about Paul Kane. He was a prophet. He was exposed for being a homosexual, and Rick Joyner admitted to that, and he really came out of this movement, the manifest sons of God. Uh, they believe that, the, again, the kingdom of God, the visible kingdom of God, will be established on earth when a certain number of people have been perfected uh, spiritually or at least are living in accordance with biblical uh, morality. This is what they believe in. And again, they, they believe uh, the idea of the atonement of Jesus died spiritually. What it is is different uh, people in the mystery schools, they take the word atonement and they create the doctrine of at one -ment. Uh, they split the word in three parts. It really means that th those who master their physical nature become at one with the divine. Uh, again, you know, we talked about it before that at one or at one minute that they become at one with the divine. Again, panentheism or pantheism. Really, it's panentheism. The idea that we become at we, we, Christ consciousness, or you, you could even say that they become uh, really a part of the divine. You know we become a part of God or a little gods again. Uh, basically, let's get into the media theology. Again, really the ideas are that man is God or man is a God. And they believe that the highest goal is to establish a society based on the universal brotherhood of man. And we could briefly get into it real fast. The dominion will get into it real uh Full steam right here. The uh, basic premise of dominion theology is that when Adam sinned, not only did man lose dominion over the earth, but God also lost control of the earth to Satan. Again, this is what we talk about in the Word of Faith, where that Adam sinned, he committed high treason, he lost dominion, and it, and it became Satan's. And then God needed a way to get back that dominion. So he 
physically had Jesus come on the earth because he could he had to operate in a physical body or his God suit. And since that time, some say that God has been an outside looking in. Again, this is kind of like deism, what deists believe that God is an outside. He left us left us to do whatever we want to do. That the God has been looking at out on the outside looking in, searching for a covenant people who will be his extension or expression in the earth to take dominion back from Satan. According to the dominionist interpretation, this is the meaning, meaning of the Great Commission, that we have to take dominion over the earth. They, have, they don't believe that the Great Commission has to do with saving souls and, you know, preaching the gospel to the ends of the world. It has to do with that. There has to be a special covenant with you know, God, that we have to take dominion back from Satan, really Christianize the world. This is what they believe in dominion theology. This is what their meaning is of the Great Commission. Some teach that it is to be accomplished with certain overcomers. That's one of their uh, key words that they use, overcomers, who by yielding themselves to the authority of Latter-day Apostles and Prophets will take control of the kingdom of this world. Uh, some of the uh, movements that are connected again to uh, Dominion theology, and when we talk about the Latter Rain movement, the Manifest Sons of God, uh, identity, uh, how you're identified in Christ. Again, this is connected to the Christian identity of British Israelism. We see a lot of these leaders that started these movements were involved in that. Uh, restorationism, uh, again, Charismatics, the Renewal, is they're involved with this. The shepherding discipleship movement is connected to Dominion theology. Uh, kingdom message, uh, positive confession. Again, again, that's the word of faith movement. One of the aspects of the word of faith movement is connected to Dominion theology. And another idea is reconstructionism uh, that we're going to take. Uh, again, it's really another fancy name for Dominion theology, reconstructionism. Now, some of the terms that you'll hear that are important to know, some of them I'll explain, some I won't, some of them are self-explanatory. Uh, some of the terms are anti-anointed one, anti-Christ spirit. Again, this is if you go against them, you have an anti-Christ spirit. Uh, at one or at one mint, which we talked about before. Uh, birthing in the spirit, uh, bride company, uh, Christ principle, covenant people. We the guy needs covenant people to you know get to get dominion back again from Satan. Uh, again, they, they use dominion a lot. The term. Uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, Elijah Company, uh, Feast of Tabernacles. They they follow the Old Testament feasts, and they say that they they're being fulfilled today. Again, the fivefold ministries. Uh, they use terms like get this into your spirit. Uh, you have to have godlike faith. Uh, they teach immortalization, uh, really become perfected on the earth, uh, part of the Dominion theology. Uh, Jezebel spirit, they teach you if you go against them, you have a Jezebel spirit in you. Again, they teach in kingdom now, kingdom principles, and kingdom theology that we're going to build in the kingdom. Uh, again, Latter Rain movement, we'll talk about the use of uh, passes from Joel. Manifest sons of God, they were little gods again. Many membered man child, uh, new breed, new order. This is what they say we're a new breed, a new order. They believe a new Zion. It's going to be a new, you know, big new theocracy or theonomy, which is the term they use, theonomy on earth. Uh, ongoing incarnation, uh, overcomers, power, uh, reconstruction and restoration in terms they use. Serpent seed, again, the idea, the idea of different serpent, the idea of interpretation of serpent seed in the Garden of Eden. Signs and wonders they believe in. Uh, sonship, they talk about the spoken word. Uh, tabernacle of David is another one. Theonomy is a term that's really the term, instead of using theocracy, they use the term theonomy to describe the kingdom they're going to build in. Uh, unity and unity and diversity is another term they use. Uh, they believe in the anointing. They believe that the anointing is a special gift of power given by the Holy Spirit to his servants to do supernatural things. They believe in something called ascension gifts, and this is, again, the idea of a fivefold ministry is that we can learn the gifts of apostle, pa prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. Uh, another term I heard this before uh, is armor bearer, and this is in the part of the prophetic apostolic movements. The idea that it's someone who is filled, 
It is filled by a man. It's a man who really does whatever the pastor watches out for the pastor. He carries the pastor's Bible to the pulpit. He'll guard the pastor's door. You know, you know, stu- things like he'll warm up his car or something. Yeah, that's kind of extreme. But some people that like, you know, they they have to watch over the pastor and you know. They had to watch the pastor's back and report if there's anything negative spoken about him. Uh, birthright is what the announcing they teach in the charismatic. Again, the, all these terms that we're using are part of the Dominion theology and charismatic movement, ecumenical movement, all these latter rain movements. All these terms are you know used by these people. Birthright, when Esau lost in a friend, you know, this is talking about Esau, um, he was told that he was going to lose his birthright. You know, this is you know a term that they use a lot. Um, carpet time. This is game talking about the Toronto and the Pensacola, the whole laughter moments that when he gets slain in the spirit, that you spend a long time on carpet, either crying, laughing, whatever, in a trance, barking like a dog, howling. That it, this is called carpet time. Uh, cemetery this is a term coined by Kenneth Hagin in re- reference to. Uh, Biblical seminaries, and you know this is a term they call it cemeteries. Of course, you should call them their school cemeteries. These these uh, teachers, uh, Father in Zion. It's an older man who's come out from mainline Orthodox beliefs to embrace to embrace these new movements of Latin Rain and Dominion theology movements. Uh, they, they they use terms like follow the cloud, uh, feeling led. Uh, this re- it refers to extra mental, divinely given intuition of what to do in any given in situation. Like, I felt led to do this. I felt led to uh, read this passage in the Bible. You know, this is a term that they use. Uh, Kenneth Copeland wrote a book, How to Be Led by the Spirit, to teach you how to follow the, this inner unction. And that's another term we'll talk about. They use terms like gatekeepers. One has been ordained by God to control the spiritual activity in the heavenlies about their above their city. Uh, impartation is a term used. It has to do with the gifts and calling that you're anoint. You're you receive the land in hands of you receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have to do every. They believe they have to do un, everything under the anointing, the so-called anointing. You 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 impart the Holy Spirit to others. Core company is anyone who does not uh, fall lock, you know, lockstep into the vision of the local house. Is it an old term they use? It's people who question the people question a pastor's decision and in a manner threatening to the power structure. These people usually rebuked, kicked to the curb. You know they they said they're sinning uh, to Satan. They're, they're in the flesh. This is the core of company. If you're not following them, a latter uh, rain. It was used to describe the outpouring at Azusa Street in California during the, the revival, which really started Pentecostalism. Um, and they they, they use the terms like the new order of the latter rain as a new you know. Now they're using C.P. Wagner use the term the third wave to describe all this. A local house is a really a local church. They call it local houses. Then this is probably the shepherding and discipleship movement that you have to have cell churches and cell groups. The manifest presence refers to a feeling uh, usually announced by the pastor or the song leader of awe. And this feeling comes after, congreg- after the congregation has praised and worshipped God intensely for an hour or so. Uh, like, like trying to... Sp- uh, much of the time in you know tongues they use uh, speaking in tongues. Um, other again the manifest sons of God. It was a doctrine from the Latin Rain movement, which taught the overcomers that these overcomers would literally become immortal before the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming. They said that, that they would put down death under their feet as a last enemy. You know these people, the manifest sons of God, would. Then set up God's kingdom on earth and hand it over to Jesus when he returns. And this is what all these people believe in. Now, now today, it can refer to any believers walking in the anointing, the so-called anointing that they re- receive, and when they get revelation knowledge of their position as priests and manifest sons of God in the earth. Uh, overcomers is a term they use. Um, again, if they, you know, they're really spiritual charismatics the idea that they're uh, uh, 
there's really a casteism. That, you know, the fathers of Zion, they say that, you know, Pentecostal uh, old-timers embrace the present-day truth is something they say. Um, you know, they're just overcomers overcoming everything. They're overcoming sin and they're becoming perfected on earth is what, you know, what, really what, this belie- what they believe in. Present day truth is is a term they use. Present day truth means whatever is currently on the you know in the spiritual realm that they use refers to whatever is currently being taught as divine revelation from from these so called prophets and apostles and these self proclaimed bishops. You know the terms they use. It doesn't really have to do. It doesn't have to resemble any former truths given in church. It could be new new truths that they're going to be getting and new revelations. Uh, a prophecy, uh, p r o p h a l i e, has to do with the vocal activity. The vocal activity of a self-proclaimed prophet is he or she proclaims the word of the Lord over an individual or congregation. Uh, this is the term they, they say. This is called a prophecy. Uh, prophetic interpretation means whatever really teach. Really, whatever get, goes into their mind and their teachings, that they're getting a prophetic interpretation from the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, psalmist, this is an, another restored office they get from the Old Testament. They say that they have a special anointing; they hear directly from God and write different psalms and worships. Uh, you know, that has divine power, and you know, it'll bring the hearers into the manifest presence of God. Really, this is that's connected to the vineyard movement from John Wimber. That you know, a lot of the vineyard they have their own music. Uh, this this really there's nothing there's no theology of God really in the music. It's really it's really worship about worship music. It's not worship of God. It's really worshiping worship. That's really what it is. A uh, religious spirit is anyone who dares to call into question anything at any time as being taught or experienced by these charismatics. So if you question like these holy laughter and prophetic movements then you say you have a religious spirit again like a Jezebel spirit revelation knowledge is direct non-mental reception of scriptural truths given to and is given to the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit to the human spirit uh, it doesn't come by studying the word of God it comes by just really just you know spontaneous movement you know and, you know movements of the Holy Spirit they say that goes into their you know and really into their spirits uh, slain in spirits when they lay hands on you and you lay down, you know, for either healing or impartation of these fivefold gifts or deliverance from demons and they fall back, you know, that's when they fall back onto the ground or slain in the spirit and then they call it, when you're laying on the ground, they call it carpet time. A catcher is these are people who stand behind people and when they're slain in the spirit, the people again catches them. Uh, this is big, you know, Pentecostal movement, charismatic movements. Soaking prayer is a term from a Toronto, the Holy Latin movement in the 90s, started in the mid 90s. Uh, it's really people who gather on an individual and lay their hands on them and pray over them in tongues for a long time. It's soaking prayer. They say that's your, it's your prayer language. When you speak in tongues, it's your prayer language that they're, you know, you're doing. Uh, sonship is an individual who is walking in revelation knowledge of who they are in Christ. In what their rights are as quote sons of God, or manifest sons of God, or little gods. Tabernacle of David is the latter rain concept of the restoration of the places where continual twenty-four hour praise and worship goes up before the Father. Uh, Rick Joyner was involved in this, and he's trying actually trying to get established, you know, as another. He was trying to get big like Mick, Mike Bickle, who we'll talk about later, was one of these Kansas City prophets. The musicians are literally, they say they're literally anointed to to uh, actually prophesy on their instruments, the tabernacle of David. Uh, word of knowledge is one of the revelation gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's when someone knows something currently going on in another's life. It may be secret sin, a prayer need, or some kind of desire or sickness in your life. Um, the problem here is that the gift, this gift, whatever it may be, is not defined for us really in the Bible. Uh, would it be words of wisdom, uh, word of knowledge, and there's words of wisdom, and they, they define this as being the ability to know the future for someone or their past activities. Again, there's no biblical definition of this. Unction is a term for the anointing 
Feared by older Pentecostals, unction. Now, Catholic Church actually uses extreme, the term of extreme unction. That you're getting the, the, the Pope gets the anointing, and when he's, you know, ex cathedra is another term the Pope uses. When he speaks ex cathedra, he's speaking really, he's really perfected, and he's really speaking from the Word of God. He's really can't do any wrong when he speaks ex cathedra. Zion is a metaphor for the overcoming remnant of the church. Uh, you know, this is a term that Zion is where God's presence is uh, today. Gladys' term we, you were using from is, uh, again, from the... We received this from site uh, discernment.org, uh site we've been quoting from before. And basically, let's get into now that we can talk about the... We'll start from the beginning, from the 1940s, from the latter rain movement. And there was a man named uh, Franklin Hall who came out in the 40s. And he, he believed in the teaching of fasting as a means of bringing about revival and the quote-unquote restoration of the church spread through the Pentecostal world. Uh, during this time, 1946, Franklin Hall wrote a book called Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer, which this book had a huge uh, impact upon Pentecostalism and, and this, you know, this what, what came out this latter rain movement and later Dominion theology. Uh, Hall, Franklin Hall claimed that even the prayers of pagans will be answered by God if they are accompanied by fasting. This is something he taught. He wrote another book called The Return of Immortality, which suggests that Christians can become immortal through stages of spiritual growth. And the idea again, you become a manifest sons of God or a little God. And through experiences and what he calls, you know, do you have to listen to closely to this? He says that you become immortal through stages of spiritual growth and through experiences with, with what he calls UFOs, UHOs, and the UIO gravitational and levitation control. <laughs> and now, now, this is from his writing, uh, the Return of Immortalities. He talks about UFOs, UHOs, UIOs. <laughs> Uh, his teachings on attaining immortality in his life through psycho-spiritual exercises and righteous living were the foundation upon which others who followed him based their immortalization theories. Hall's main point in his immortalization theory is that the sleeping, so-called unfoundationally built church must awaken to a real cause and calling that when God's word is completely acted upon and complied with against you know, spiritual laws, this will result in bringing about the real gushers and torrents of the long past due reign of righteousness, a reign of immortality upon the earth so that many prophets have written about and portrayed in their prophecies. And that was you know, from his books, Return of Immortality, and he agreed more on atomic power with God through fasting and prayer. Um... His main penchant for a form of Christian, he actually believed in a form of Christian astrology, is evidenced further in his statement that he believed in 19, in, excuse me, 1848 AD, the Aquarian Age, he said, was introduced to the world. This is what he said, Franklin Hall. Though, you know, everyone familiar with the New Age movement will recognize that the Aquarian Age, they call it the Golden Age of Enlightenment, again, the gold and, you know, of course, this is connected to the gold dust movement. Again, it's we're receiving new knowledge. All this gold dust stuff is really part of the new age. It's it has nothing to do with Christianity. It's a new golden age, and you know we're going to be perfected on earth. You know, gold dust has nothing to do with you know Christianity. And it's believed well, mankind will allegedly take a quantum leap, in, quantum leap in his evolutionary progress to immortalization. This is what the new age movement believes too. We're going to be little gods on earth. Uh, another man, important man, uh, after Franklin Hall, really borrowed from Franklin Hall, was a man who called William, William Branham. And in, there's inscribed on a pyramid, again, a pyramid shaped tombstone in a Jeffersonville, Indiana cemetery, are the names of seven churches of the Book of Revelation. This is where his grave site is. William Branham. It's a big pyramid-shaped tombstone, and that should give you a clue to what, who was behind him, and what he believed in pyramids. 
uh, in their seven churches of the book of Revelation there. He said that Ephesian, the Ephesian church at the base represents the beginning of the church age. The Laodicean near the top represents the end of the church age. On opposite faces of this tombstone are the names of seven men whose impact on the church throughout its history has been significant. Where the two faces of the pyramid juxtaposed one over the other, we would see the names of the church superimposed over the men's names in the following order. The Ephesian was Paul. Sumerian church was Irenaeus, uh, Pergamene was Martin, uh, Thyatrean was Columba, Sardisian was Luther, Philadelphian was Wesley, and Laodicean was William Branham. In 1948, William Branham, a passive preacher, he became Pentecostal and was greatly influenced by Franklin Hall's teachings, especially through Hall's book, again, Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer. Branham gained notoriety for his teachings on what he called God's Seventh Church Age, which is supposedly the final move of God before the manifestation of his kingdom throughout the earth. Again, this idea that there's seven church ages in the book of Revelation, that they're really church time periods, is this is what they believe in dispensationalism, that the seven churches in Revelation have to do with seven time periods, and in the last church age is lively they seen, and this is what we're going through now. Um, William Branham based this belief on uh, the manifestation of God's kingdom throughout the earth on Joel 2.23 we're talking about the latter reign Joel 2.23 and Revelations 1.20 through chapter 3 verses 32 uh, again Joel 2.23 and Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 through chapter 3 verse 32 in Branham's teachings on Joel 2.23, Branham defined the latter reign as a neo-Pentecostalism of his day. He said that this would be a restoration of a church out of, out of so-called denominationalism, which he equated with the mark of the beast. Branham believed that the word of God was given in three forms, and those forms were the zodiac, the Egyptian pyramids, and the written scriptures. Again, you see where he's coming from, he believes... In the Zodiac, Christian astrology like Frank and Hall, and the Egyptian pyramids, this is how you say the word of God is bringing forth. And finally, the written scripture. The Zodiac's theory was not new, having been put forth by a man named Joseph A. Sice in his 1884 book, The Gospel in the Stars. Almost a decade later, in 1893, E.W. Bolger came out with a book called The Witness of the Stars. And another leader who actually believed in this Christian astrology movement was uh, D. James Kennedy was involved in this. The idea, you know, he used these books that, you know, uh, Marilyn Hickey, I believe, taught this to William Banks. Uh, Kennedy, G. G. James Kennedy is big in it. The idea of Christian astrology and zodiac is really, you know, you, it's really a Christian uh, word of God in, the, in, in here. The idea that the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt was constructed by Enoch as a memorial to God is at least as old as a Zodiac theory and is popular with the Dawn Bible students and offshoot of the Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, again, the idea he taught, William Brown taught the idea of the serpent seed that Eve had sex with the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And he really had an anger towards women and this contributed to the development of his bizarre serpent seed teaching. He bases on a twisted interpretation of Genesis 3.13. He said that when Eve when Eve said a certain beguiled me and I did eat, that this meant that she, that the serpent was had seduced her sexually and, and then out of this uh, sexual act was born Cain. And then they get into the idea of racism, that this is how the Jewish race was born. Some of them thought that this is how blacks came about and I, I, I believe that Reverend Moon of the Unification Church, the Moonies, he believed that this is how communists came about from this evil affair of Cain, how Cain was from uh, Eve and the Serpent. Uh, the idea that he believed that he had these uh, visions uh, when he was a little child, William Branham, and they, people said that they saw a circular halo about a foot in diameter above the bed where he laid. Uh, he said at the age of three, he began to hear experiences of what he called the voice. The uh, unquote, quote unquote, the voice. And he said that this was his angel. 
you know, that he received. And he was one of the foremost, Brandon was one of the foremost proponents of the theory of the healing and of imparting of the Holy Spirit through laying on of hands. He claimed to feel heat in his hands. Again, L. O. Roberts says he claimed heat in his right hand, and Benny Hinn says that he uh, sometimes his right hand goes numb, or his hand goes numb. He claimed to feel heat in his hand, and he touched affected parts, and appeared to exhibit a remarkable clairvoyance in knowing intimate details of the lives of the people he had never seen before. And this is what he received this from his so-called uh, angel. Uh, there's another movement that came out right around this time in 1940s, in fall 1947. Two former pastors for the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, George Houghton and Percy G. Hunt, joined in an independent ministry with with Herrick Holt, pastor of the North Battlefield Sesquan Church of the Foursquare Gospel. That ministry to Sharon Orphanage and Schools which Holt had originally started in a large residence in North Battlefield. And this later came, became the Sharon uh, Brethren. And from the Sharon Brethren in their schools, this became really a center of the latter rain movement from the Sharon Brethren of George Hawkins and Percy G. Hunt. Uh, there was another man named George Warnock who in 1951 wrote a book called The Feast of Tabernacles in which he laid out a specific doctrine for the latter rain movement and I, and I have this uh, looked at this book uh, what he teaches really is that, that the church was about to usher in the completion of the God's Old Testament feasts through perfection of the saints in their dominion over the earth they believe that the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of all these feasts that they're being fulfilled today, and these, there's, again, really time periods or time ages that we're going through now in, in you know, in the New Testament church. Essentially, this latter teaching applies that the three great annual feasts of the Lord in Israel's worship, such as the Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, typify the whole church age, beginning with the Jesus, death of Jesus on the cross, and consummating in the manifestation of the sons of God, the so-called overcomers, who will become perfected and step into immortality in order to establish the kingdom of God on earth. According to George Warnock, this will be accomplished through the restoration of the church in unity, again, the ecumenical movement in unity, you know, the idea of denom denominationalism will be destroyed, that it's evil from Satan, and once that restoration is realized, the saints will, quote, unquote, eat the Lord's Supper in reality. And a lot of these move people involved in these so-called uh, movements in the 40s and 50s were, uh, we'll talk about A.A. Allen, Gordon Lindsay, Oral Roberts, W.V. Grant, that's, uh, he's big today, O.L. Jaggers, uh, Demo Shakarian, who's the founder of Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International, uh, Bill Britton is a, is a name uh, that believes in all these uh, movements. But today, let's get into uh, the idea of um, Manifest Sons of God uh, teaching. The Manifest Sons of God teaching contains all the elements of a classic dominion theory or dominion theology. The idea that there's going to be perfection, immortalization, Restoration of the church, restoration again of the offices of, of apostles and prophets, the idea of absolute authoritarianism. The idea this is connected to shepherding the discipleship movement. Later, we'll talk about again extreme shepherding discipleship movement, attainment of uh, godhood, and the idea of uh, you know this is really all connected to the manifest sons of God. This is you know what they believe in. Central to the, their belief, the Manifest Sons of God doctrine from the Latter Rain movement, is a belief that some ship to God comes through a higher revelation. The Christian life, it is believed, is fragmented into stages of maturity. The first step is that of servant of God, the next is that of friend of God. Following this is to become a son of God and ultimately God, little gods ourselves. Again, the idea of, you know, obviously Manifest Sons of God. Two major set, sects to which the Manifest Sons of God title appeared were the Walk in the Body of Christ. The Walk came out of the latter rain movement under the so-called apostleship of John Robert Stevens, who was a disciple of William Branham. 
whose Church of the Living Word was in uh, Redondo Beach, California. The Body of Christ movement was the brainchild of a man named Sam, Sam Fife, who was a Baptist minister who claimed to receive revelations from God concerning the restoration of the church through his apostleship. Besides John Robert Stevens and Sam Fife, there were many apostles that came out of the Manifest Sons of God movement, such as, again, George Warnock, Francis Frankenpain, who is big today, World Conquest, and Bill Britton, again. A uh, term they used for the manifestos of God, they used Romans 8, 19-23. Again, Romans 8, 19-23, and, and that says, For the earnest expectation of the cre cre creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And this is you know, just some of the ideas that will become little, uh, little God's manifestation of the sons of God. This is what they teach. The doctrine crucial to the manifest sons of God is that perfection or sinless living will result in immortalization. Those who will come or overcome death will qualify as worthy to rule in the kingdom of God. Uh, they teach that rather, rather that Christ and the church are becoming one in nature and essence, and that the church, they believe, is is the so-called ongoing incarnation of God. They believe that really we are the we are Christ on earth. And the idea where we're become a really a part of God since we're the body of Christ. Christ is the head, and we're the body. We're really, you know, we're really representing. We're really Christ on earth. This is again the idea of pantheism and panentheism. There are even those who, like Sam Fife, believe that they have already attained a state of perfection and as a result will never die. The kingdom message teachings are also almost identical to those of the Manifest Sons of God movement. The emphasis on this revised Manifest Sons of God movement is on a kingdom now theology, which states that the kingdom of God is a present reality in the earth, and is only waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God to demonstrate the kingdom by taking their authority over the kingdoms of the earth. This will take place before Jesus can return. This, this, they believe that this has to happen for, in order for Jesus' the second coming to take place and then a thousand year uh, millennial reign. A major teaching borrowed from the manifest sons of God is that those Christians who will attain positions of authority over the kingdoms of the earth are the so-called many-membered man-child. Again, we talked about that concept before. Another idea they believe in, we talk about, is restoration. The restoration teachings focus on the belief that the church has not functioned, hasn't functioned as God planned since the first century. Therefore, it must be restored to its original purpose of achieving dominion on the earth. This involves the restoration of the offices and apostles and prophets the restoration of the tabernacle of David, again, is what this is signified by the restoration of worship and praise music, and the idea of the restoration of power, which has to do with signs. We talked about power before it was a term. The restoration of power has to do with uh, signs and wonders. Similar to the manifest sons of God, restoration believes in immoralization through perfection. At the heart of the rest of restoration is the goal of establishing the visible kingdom of God on earth in the physical absence of Jesus, and then Jesus can come back. Another, Again, another element of restoration is what they call the tabernacle of David. This means that before the church can be perfected in established dominion on earth, it must restore praise and worship music as a means to enter into the presence of God. Only then will his blessings be poured out upon his people, and they will be given the power to subdue spiritual principalities. Again, Eddie, we have to get in a you know, the vineyard movement of John Wimber was big in this day. We're going to really get into the presence of God. They have a whole series of music, the vineyard movement. And this is what these new revivals in Pensacola, Toronto were using. They were using these vineyard movements. The idea that we're going to take dominion really had nothing to do with the blood of Christ to save your, you know, save your sins. You know, uh, it really has nothing to do, really no theology in this, this, these music. Uh, the dancing in these movements, again, is usually choreographed. And I've seen this first-hand experience in churches I've been to. The dancing is choreographed, and is it is 
common to find women and girls especially participating. The usual formula to dance in is really they use a wide circle. And this is really, you could say this is really similar to that engaged by the ancient Druids who worship nature and their counterparts like Wicca and witchcraft religion, they believe that they dance in circles and the circle they believe is a magical uh, form. Uh, more movement quickly is uh, the shepherding and discipleship movement. This is really a, a lot of big influential movement in the church that started, you know, big in the 20th century. In the mid, mid to late 1960s, two young Catholics who were on the secretariat of the Corsillo movement, which is a Roman Catholic advocacy group, became deep, deeply involved in the charismatic renewal. In 1967, these two young men, Steve Clark and Ralph Martin, decided to hold meetings in their apartment. From this initial meeting, a fewer than a dozen people grew, it grew to the Word of God Charismatic Fellowship. Today, through a subsidiary organization known as the Sword of Spirit, uh, this is a they control a lot, a lot of churches, a lot of uh, networks of, of thousands of members uh, today. In the early 1970s, Clark and Martin began to make contacts with the leaders of the Christian Growth Ministries in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, led by men who become known as the Fort Lauderdale Five. And these five men who so-called prophets or apostles were Bob Mumford, Derek Prince, Don Basham, uh, Ern Baxter, who was an early associate of William Branham, and finally Charles Simpson. By 1974, these five, plus Clark and Martin, along with a man named John Poole, formed a secret group called the Council. Again, that's an interesting title, the Council. The purpose of the Council was to coordinate efforts between the Word of God and Christian Growth Ministries in a common cause to convert the world through ecumenical cooperation in a tightly controlled spiritual environment. Eventually, other men became involved in the Council, including men like Tom Monroe, Dick King, Ray Ostendorf, Larry Christensen, Kevin Rainigan, Paul DeSells, Jim Cavnor, Don Fottenheimer, and Dick Coleman. And the purpose of the council, they said, was that the Lord is bringing us a work that many in the church do not understand. Bringing believers together in a committed, discipled, disciplined, submitted relationship to be a network of bodies that can be a servant to God in the world. That is our primary call. Out of that work, we'll be, we will be able to speak to the charismatic renewal, to the church, and to the world, but our primary concern is with the bodies. Uh, that was one of their, st their stated, stated purposes of their, the council. During their pilgrimage to the Holy Land in 1977, the council began to enter into relationships with Leon Joseph Cardinal Su Suenens. At their June 1st meeting in 1977 at St. Ca Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai, Israel, Clark and Martin informed the council that Cardinal Suenens wanted to enter in a, into a so-called covenantal relationship with them. And he did, and they had this big, uh, they drafted this big statement of what they were, you know, really going to do. It's really, he's obviously a Catholic, and this is getting connected to the Catholic Church. Uh, considering that the purpose of the council was to establish a network of committed, submitted bodies under an authoritarian structure, its collaboration with the Roman Catholic Church is obviously significant. And this is, again, yeah, connected to the separating, separating and discipleship movement. It's really a broad-based ecumenical outreach designed to conform the entire church really into an authoritarian structure. The idea that you have really, you know, an, a leader over you. You have to, you know, do whatever these shepherds or disciples say. You know, the idea that the cell groups or cell churches came out of this. Yeah, you have to, you have to confess your faults to these people. You have to confess your sins. And then, you know, they'll disciple you and shepherd you into what you have to do. A movement that came out of this really shepherding movement was called the International Church of Christ, or also it's called the Boston Church of Christ by a man named Kip uh, McLean, I believe his last name was. It was big in Boston, and I went to college, and this was big in my college where I, there was a you know, group, the International Body of Christ, and they really, whenever they could do anything, they had to take special classes, and they had to okay it with their shepherds and disciples in order to really do anything, they wanted to go out anywhere, uh, go out with friends to pick classes, what classes to choose, 
they really had to okay it with their shepherding and discipleship movement. That's really extreme version of it. But this is what these these movements like Bob Mumford, Derek Prince, Don Basham, these famous leaders they this is what they really did in these churches. They uh, shepherd and disciple. This is a, another aspect of the Dominion theology. Uh, would, they they received again the purpose was of achieving dominion over the temporal world system. Again, the, we talked about the Dominion theology is predicated upon three beliefs. Uh, one is that Satan usurped man's dominion over the earth through the temptation of Adam and Eve. Again, the idea of Adam committed high treason and we lost our dominion to Satan. Then the idea is that the church is God's instrument to take dominion back from Satan. And three, Jesus cannot or will not return until the church has taken dominion by gaining control of the earth's governmental and social and political institutions. That we have to really Christianize uh, the world. And this is what the Lucene Committee, the Lucene movement was when Billy Graham was involved with this. The idea we're going to create world Christians and, you know, really his idea that everyone, really everyone is saved. Um, again, the idea that they, they believe that we really have to purge uh, the earth. There are differences of opinion among Dominionists as to how to just dissenters will be removed from the earth but there are basically a bunch of uh, ways to do this one is that God will supernaturally strike dead those who oppose his apostles and prophets and we heard this before a lot of people like Benny Hinn said don't stretch your hand against his ministry that you know you they say that you will be struck dead another is that God will send or allow satanic forces to send plagues upon dissenters another one is that church or certain overcomers will pronounce God's judgment upon dissenters, thus moving God to destroy them. Uh, another is that the church will, out of necessity, use physical force by which it will judge, sentence, and execute judgment, including death upon dissenters. And we'll get into this idea later of their so-called Joel's army. And another uh, thing that they say is that all they really believe in all or any combination of these uh, beliefs that I that I said that they're gonna physically remove and purge the earth of people who oppose them hey Rob uh, hey I want to thank thank you a bunch um, is there any specific sites books etc you might like to direct people to uh, if anyone wants to look that I mean from there's a book uh, vengeance is ours by Al Dager about the church and demeaning theology and he, he also wrote another book Al Dager called the world Christian movement explaining this and there's good sites like uh, deception in the church dot com, where you could there's like so a lot of articles on the latter rain movement in the main theology. Mm-hmm. Again, discernment dot org mm-hmm. is discernment. another another good uh, website. You know, and we've been using lots lot of this book from Al Dager, Vengeance is Ours, uh, by Dager, and these websites. Again, it's really good information. There's, there's so many books on on these topics. Yeah, I know you've sent me box loads of them to get ready for this series we've been doing. Hey, we better wrap her up, Rob. And okay. I want to thank you for doing this again, and uh, we'll be continuing tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, the 2nd of August, uh, with another part of the series, uh, more specifically on these topics of uh, Dominion Theology, Latter Rain Movement, Manifest Son of God, etc., in this long series to culminate into a Mystery Babylon 2. So, remember the website, hourofthetime.com. And my direct email is hour of the time at hotmail.com. And again today, Monday, the first of July or excuse me, August two thousand and five. I want to thank everybody for tuning in.
computers than these appliances is the praxis behind them. Ages old. The underground current which informs the modern project and this modern era. You see, for life in our modern era is little more than life in an open-air mind control laboratory. To transform the mass of targeted percipients plugged into the electronic and digital pageantry of the establishment's system of things into the perfect human zombie. They disguised their true intent and their true teachings, the esoteric, with a system of exoteric descriptions that to the profane would mean one thing and to the initiate or the adept would mean quite another but that was then this is now you're already in the new world order you're already in the new world order world order what sort of creature inhabits the modern domain who is the modern man he is the smartest most advanced individual to ever strut the planet, the most relatively liberated being in history. He scoffs with great division at the idea of the existence and operation of a technology of mass mind control emanating from the media and government. Modern man believes that he is much too smart to believe anything as superstitious. But the truth is, modern man, ladies and gentlemen, is the idea.